Hello, I'm Elvira Carizal Dukes, a doctoral candidate in the Rhetoric and Composition program at the University of Texas at El Paso English Department. I'm from a small colonia outside of El Paso, Texas called Chaparral. I grew up in Cholo and Chola communities. I'm first generation college in my large blended family. My mom immigrated from Chihuahua and my dad grew up in El Paso. As a scholar, I want to research my own community to better understand my lived experiences. My dissertation study examines the Cholo and Chola subculture. Growing up, I interacted easily with Cholos and Cholas, but I also knew that in society there was an overall negative idea of Cholos and Cholas. My research examines where those negative ideas stem from. James Diego Vigil's research tells us that the word cholo comes from the Spanish word solo, which in English means alone or abandoned, as a reflection of their marginal identity. He also notes that not all cholos are in gangs. I also discuss cholex as a new term used by artists in my study that describe it as making meaningful art through a cholo or chola consciousness. My research will build on Cholo and Chola research by discussing Cholex consciousness through visual and written representations by Cholex artistas. For my dissertation study, I have drawn on theoretical frameworks from Chicana feminist epistemology, Latino critical theory, and social justice rhetorics as discussed by Dolores Delgado Bernal, Kendall Leon, Tara Yoso, Daniel Solorzano, Victor Villanueva, Asao Inoy, and Gloria Anzaldúa. My methodology is qualitative research data from participant video interviews and observations, cultural artifacts, and my research participants' own writing. I analyzed the data and conducted a thematic analysis. I interviewed two major Cholex artists in person, as well as Cholos and Cholas in their neighborhoods of Pilsen in Chicago and Chihuahua City, Chihuahua. I also reflect on my own autoethnographic experiences as a Chicana scholar and an author of comic books and films. I examine my own community of Chaparral and El Paso and its relationship with Cholos and Cholas. A Cholo veterano in Chaparral talked about the original values and respect in Cholo and Chola culture and is something he believes is disappearing. This is why I believe my research is important. My research connects with the growing interest of Cholo and Chola identity, arts, and culture. I conclude my study by discussing Japoneros, which are Cholos and Cholas in Japan. My dissertation study is a critical examination of this phenomena through visual rhetoric and writing studies as a critical disciplinary lens. My goal is to put forth Cholex storytelling as a method for social justice rhetorics. I want to make salient the images and stories of the Cholo and Chola subculture in order to disrupt the oppressive systems and ideologies that have kept them in the margins. Specifically, I argue that we must examine Cholo and Chola subjects as agents of social change. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Moinul Moshet Porak Chaudhuri. I'm a PhD candidate from the Department of Computer Science at UTEP. My supervisor is Dr. Christopher Kickinwells. My research interest is in reinforcement learning, game theory, and artificial intelligence. As you can see from my slide, uh, it is about autonomous trading in a smart grid. Our traditional energy grid has several issues, such as high carbon emission, because uh, most of the power we generate are from fossil fuels. And there is also zero customer participation. For example, if you see uh, in the slide, there's a picture of a solar panel on a home. Uh, if you're a customer and you have that setup and you are generating some energy, you cannot sell that energy to the grid. There is no such system, no such mechanism uh, right now. And also there is this uh, monopolistic environment in, in our traditional energy grid where there is only one seller and many buyers. Uh, and uh, and future smart grid promises to solve these issues. And the future smart grids will be a series of markets, like in the slide you can see the wholesale market where there are large energy suppliers and in the balancing, there's a balancing market, there's a tariff market where there are the retail customers like us. And all these markets are connected by, by brokers who are like autonomous agents who are self-driven by the data. These brokers go into the wholesale market, try to buy energy from the wholesale market and comes back to the tariff market and tries to sell energy to the tariff market by offering some tariffs uh, to the customers. So basically the tariff is a contract between the broker and the customers and using this tariff customers also can sell their generated and renewable energy back to the grid. So this is how we are able to solve the customer participation issue, the monopolistic, break the monopolistic structure, and also have uh, renewable energy sources incorporated into the system. 
So my research is about to find what are the good strategies for these broker agents so that they can trade in the wholesale market and the tariff market in a profitable way. For example, how they can buy energy at a cheaper price from the wholesale market and, and what, what are the better strategies to trade in the tariff market so that they can have higher revenue. So uh, the whole point is, and the, 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 the broader impact of this also to check how, how this is economically sustainable, economical feasibility of this whole framework, and, and how, how we can have such a grid which will be able to provide us a more reliable, robust, and with more green and clean energy with a transparent uh, a trading mechanism. Thank you. There's an abundance of phenomenon that changes over time in nature. For example, the flapping of the wings of an insect. Now, we can model those phenomena mathematically using functions that take into account that time. And by using the mathematics, we can actually analyze them and use them to many, for many things. These are dynamical systems, and we use them for simulations to predict the future. We use them to adjust the parameters of these models to try to predict what, how small changes actually affect the outcome of a situation or to design new things. For example, using the measurements of the wings of an insect to actually design a drone that flies like the real thing, a really small scale drone. Now, the main challenge with dynamical systems is that even the simplest form, the simplest equation, to actually solve it, we need to generate thousands and thousands of equations. And the only way to solve them is through computers and through computer algorithms. And the current traditional methods are really good for the most part. But for certain types of problems, they face some challenges. For example, if we want to minimize the amount of energy consumption that the drone has, uh, the traditional methods return a solution or return a possible candidate, but they have no guarantee that if it's actually the best. And if it doesn't find a solution, doesn't mean that there isn't one. These traditional methods cannot guarantee that. But in our field, we use interval methods which provide that guarantee by not considering uh, things as single numbers, but ranges of numbers of quantities instead of a single quantity. Now, this means that by taking these large quantities of things, we can use these intervals to actually eliminate all the options that are not the best, and we can guarantee we'll find the best. And if we eliminate everything, that means we couldn't find a solution. Now, uh, for dynamical systems, that means the simulation, instead of following a line, it follows something similar to a tube. And this tube encloses all the possible solutions. There's two main approaches to this. One of them is fast, but at some point starts getting wider than it should be. And another one actually manages to get some narrow solutions, but it is super slow. It takes forever to finish. My research focuses on systems that need long-term simulations that both of these approaches fail to solve. And by combining the fast approach and then when it starts getting too large, we contract it with the other approach. This way, we'll have this narrow enough tubes that can last for longer and we can have longer term simulations that all the other two ones cannot solve. Imagine you live in a quiet little town in West Texas and all of a sudden large oil companies come and start drilling for oil and out of nowhere, boom, you feel an earthquake. This is a reality for a lot of citizens in the city of Pegas, Texas, just 200 miles away. Over the past few years, there's been a huge increase in earthquakes that align with oil and gas companies drilling in the area. And by huge, I mean less than 10 earthquakes occurring in 2009, which has now increased to thousands of earthquakes per year since 2018. My goal is to figure out exactly where in the subsurface these earthquakes are occurring. This area has pretty complex geology. Some earthquakes are known to naturally occur along faults, while some appear related to oil and gas procedures. This is known as human-induced seismicity. Knowing the depth and location of these events is crucial because it can give us an idea of which of these two sources is causing these events. There are about 10,000 people living in the city of Pecos, Texas, and their safety is everyone's number one concern. We start by first collecting the seismic data, which are just sound waves using an array of geophones. Geophones are essentially portable earthquake detectors. We can locate earthquakes within the seismic data because they have a characteristic sound wave pattern. Ideally, we will see the sound wave pattern on multiple geophones. For example, if an earthquake begins in the south, the geophones closer to it will start recording the sound waves earlier compared to the geophones in the north 
because it took a longer time for the sound waves to travel there. Once we have these arrival times for an earthquake on each geophone, we can input those times into a computer program, which will output the earthquake's beginning time, latitude, longitude, and depth within the subsurface. We do this for each earthquake until we have a large catalog of events. From here, we can create 3D models, which tells us where a majority of the earthquakes are occurring, which gives us an idea of which source is causing them. The depth is the most important information to telling us which source is causing these earthquakes. Events in this area vary in depth from one kilometers to seven kilometers. The shallower events tend to be human induced by oil companies, and the events at seven kilometers occur along ancient faults, so they can possibly be naturally occurring events. Overall, there is a lot about the Pecos area that still needs to be discovered. It's possible that there are unknown faults within the subsurface, which we would be able to map with our data. Further analysis of oil company procedure locations compared with the actual earthquake locations needs to be accomplished to really tie down their causes. To conclude, a lot of things go into solving a complex geology problem, but the final result will help decrease earthquake numbers in Pecos, Texas. Thank you. Namaste. El Paso Ares cities are no stranger to high pollution days. Hence, as part of our daily routine, most of us do check for the air quality updates along with weather forecasts. However, there are certain days where the reality is much different compared to the forecast. And this happens because the air quality model during its simulation runs assume values of certain parameters. One such very important parameter whose value is assumed during these runs is called planetary boundary layer height. Now you might ask me, what is this planetary boundary layer? And how does it concern us? Well, planetary boundary layer is the lowest part of the atmosphere, which gets influenced by surface heating and cooling along with winds and the local topography. So during the daytime, this layer expands and at night it contracts. Most importantly, it's that part of the atmosphere where we all live in. Majority of the pollutants such as pollens, aerosols and emissions coming out from automobiles and industries are trapped within this layer. As you can see in the figure below, during the daytime when this layer expands, it can dilute all those pollutants. Whereas at night, when it contracts, it can increase the concentration of the pollutants. Hence, for people who go for jogging at night, thinking it's the cleanest time of the day, they better reconsider. Now, a better knowledge of planetary boundary layer structure for this region can help us understand the local air quality along with pollution emission, its transport and its accumulation. And that's exactly what is part of my dissertation. I do this analysis using remote sensing techniques and instrumentation. And this information of planetary boundary layer structure can be used to enhance the accuracy of the regional air quality model. So overall, the outcome of my dissertation is that in future, we can improve the accuracy of the air quality model for this mountainous region using experimental values of planetary boundary layer structure. Thank you. Imagine that you are sleeping and covered from toe to neck. Now imagine that in the same night, there is a bug, a starving bug looking for blood now conclude yourself, uncovered face, starving bug. Yeah, the bug would target your face. And that's why they're called the kissing bugs. Kissing bugs transmit through the feces the parasite Trypanosoma cruzi that causes Chagas disease. Just here in USA, it is estimated that 300,000 people are infected with the parasite. Almost 10,000 people die every year with complications related with the presence of the parasite, for instance, in the heart. So don't fool yourself. It might start with a sweet kiss, but can end up with a broken heart. And you might be thinking, I wouldn't fall for it. I would notice such a big bug biting my face. Let me tell you something. They do have a secret. And the secret is a saliva composition. The saliva is full of molecules with different function. 
such as that cause anesthesia, prevent blood coagulation and inflammation. So the saliva helps the bug in the feeding process and also can help in the decrease infection. My research is twofold. First, is to describe the molecules present in the saliva and to understand how those molecules can interfere in the decrease infection. And second, is to test if the saliva, the molecules present in the saliva can be used to distinguish the population that have been exposed to the bite from the ones that haven't. This is important in epidemiological studies where you want to find the population on the risk. So far, we are able to describe a lot of uh, molecules, including lipids, proteins, and metabolites. We are also able to prove that, yes, the saliva can be used to distinguish the population that have been exposed to the bite. In conclusion, our research can be used to the construction of a database that would help another researchers in the development of new drugs, such as new anesthetic and anti-inflammatory drugs, and also the development of epidemiological tools that can be used to find that population under risk. Thank you. Everyone sleeps, animals and humans. However, the main function of sleep is really not well understood. We know it helps us with our immune system. We know it helps us recover from injuries. And we also know it helps us clear out any toxic byproducts we generate during our daily activities. On the other hand, loss of sleep uh, causes uh, problems in memory formation. It also makes us more prone to mistakes. We know this because when human subjects were um, tested after a bad night, a bad night of sleep using the GONOGO test, which is used to measure impulsivity in humans, they were more prone to making mistakes. We also know that about 60 to 70% of people with ADHD also show aberrant sleep patterns, meaning that they don't have really uh, good night sleeps. Um, my project aims to further our understanding how sleep and inhibitory control um, are connected. The way that I do this is by using the Drosophila melanogaster, and also by adapting the Gonogo test for the Drosophila flies. Um, the way that I will approach this is by disrupting the sleep of, of flies physically, um, and also by feeding them caffeine in order for them to not, to not sleep at night. Another factor will be to be looking at um, flies, flies that have genetic mutations which reduce the sleep during the night. After testing these three different approaches uh, using the Gonogo test in flies, I was able to discover that uh, drug feeding and genetic mutations um, lead to impulsivity in flies or um, not the, the, reduce the ability to suppress their movement under our Gonova test. However, uh, when looking at the physically disrupted flies, those flies did not show any loss of inhibitory control. At the end of the day, my project aims to uncover noble targets for drug development uh, and drug treatment for people which, who show um, loss of sleep and also loss of, of, of um, uh, impulsivity, such as the ones we see in uh, ADHD patients. Our desert is changing, partially due to human impacts and also in response to natural vegetation shifts. It's no secret that urban development displaces wildlife. You don't see as many lizards running around in the city as you do when you hike on the outskirts of town. But what is happening in these still wild places in our desert, the Northern Chihuahuan Desert? The past 150 years has seen a shift from native grasslands to shrub dominated landscape. This process of shrubification has been shown to impact the abundance of native wildlife, including lizards. So why study lizards? Well, lizards eat insects, a lot of insects, and a wide variety of predators eat lizards. This makes them an integral part of the food chain in our ecosystem. Given their importance, are these differences in lizard communities between grasslands and shrubified landscapes present? 
And if so, what do they impact? I study lizard communities in our desert by pitfall trapping. I dug 144 five-gallon buckets into the ground and visited the same nine field sites for a year. They were in three different vegetation types, grassland and two types of shrubified landscape, creosote bush flats and mesquite dune habitats. I made 923 total lizard captures and found stark differences between my three habitat types. When I analyzed my data, I found the answer to my research question. The grasslands showed a wide variety of species between one another, but in the two types of shrubified landscapes, I found a more limited variety of lizard species. And the composition of those communities was the same no matter what type of shrubified landscape I was in. So community composition in the grasslands was more diverse and unpredictable, but no matter where I went in the shrubified landscape, the communities of lizards looked the same. This indicates that as our desert changes due to shrubification, our lizard communities will shift. If we suddenly can't support the diversity of insect-eating lizard species found in native grassland habitats, then we might lose out on the benefits that some of these lizard species provide. For example, whiptail lizards eat termites, and that means less termites eating the wood frame of your house. The fact of the matter is, our desert is changing. This has profound impacts upon the desert wildlife communities and us as community members of the desert Southwest.